You're listening to SM Media, the number one place for exclusive content. Hi everyone and welcome to the latest episode of The Sit Down right here on SM Media. I'm Scott McPay, delighted to be your host as always. We've got a very special guest in this week's episode. I'm joined by the former Hibs and Dunfermline midfielder, former manager of Albion Rovers, Kevin Harper. Kevin, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you on to the show. Thanks very much for joining me. Cheers, Scott. No worries at all. Looking forward to it, mate. I hope Brilliant. you won't get any dodgy questions. <laughs> I'll try my best. How you been? How's everyone been? <laughs> Good mate, I'm good. Uh, obviously, just looking at seeing getting back into the game. I've uh, just started the Moan Academy, as you yeah. probably you probably know. Uh, so that's that's up and running. Moan Academy and football team as well, uh, football club. So we've got three teams at the present moment in time. Uh, there's more more coming on board. So looking forward to getting the kids in and, and just developing them, and you know, hopefully be the, the go to academy. Uh, when, when kids, you know, where they want to go if they get released and, and from from the game, you know, pro youth, we'll be we'll be there to catch them and give them that second chance and, and protect them and help them understand how they can get back into the game. Brilliant. Obviously, as well, you you were the manager at Albion just after just before lockdown. Like, what was which what's it been like? Obviously, been out of the game for that long. Are you looking to get back into management at some point? Yeah, it would be good to get back in. It doesn't need to be management, mate. It could be coaching, you know, assistant, whatever. But you know, at the end of the day, there's there's managers that have had the sack, those managers that are still there, you know, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to get in. I felt I'd done a, a good enough job to deserve it. I'll be to deserve another chance, you know, but if that, that comes, uh, hopefully it will come. Hopefully it won't take me uh, 40, at least 40 interviews this time. Obviously as well, like, oh, yeah, you, well, well, do you remember kind of what your football memories were like growing up? Like, who was your kind of heroes when you were starting, starting to get into when, football? When I started to get in, it was uh, Mark Walters, John okay. Barnes and Ali McCoist uh, for probably three different reasons. Uh, Mark Walters for, you know, the way that he dealt with the abuse that he got, certainly yeah. up here, uh, has been, has been, has been a, as a, a black player, you know, and, and the way he carried himself on it. Uh, obviously, John Barnes, just for his, his ability, sheer ability. Uh, yeah. I thought he was tremendous and he played wide as well. So I always felt that, even when I was a striker, I always felt that I was going to end up wide because... I don't think I was a natural goal scorer, if I'm honest with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Ali McCoyst, I think he, he scored goals, you know, for Rangers uh, tenfold, really. But what I, what I liked about Ali and what I liked to, about him still to this day is the fact that, you know, everybody likes him. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you're, a, whether you're a Celtic fan or Rangers fan, he's broke Celtic hearts many times, but I think the majority of people like him. He's, he comes across really well and he's funny and you, you just hear, hear what he's doing, you know, and... and the, the Euros just now, which is which is great. Definitely. Obviously, when you were you were growing up, was, was football always what you wanted to do? Uh, believe it or not, it wasn't. I wanted to be a pilot or a, a, bar, a barrister when I grew up. All right. Uh, so I know the barrister's more of an English an English thing than a, than a Scottish thing. That was the two things that that I wanted to wanted to do. But you know, I, I sort of fell into football really in the sense I was I, probably some people have heard this story. I, I was out playing with my mate, just in the street playing football. We were playing football and he's like, oh, I need to go. And I'm like, why? He's like, oh, I've got football training. And I was like, what am I going to do? And he's like, I don't know. <laughs> and I, I went, is it okay if I come with you? And he, he says, yeah, go and ask your mum. So I went and asked my mum and off we went away across uh, the Postal Park to Sight Hill, mm-hmm. which was a bit of a trek, the back end of Sight Hill, uh, to Celtic North. And pretty much that's how it started. And then, obviously, your boys' club days. What was your memories of then? And then, obviously, going to Hutchie Vale later on? My, my memories was, you know, I, I was only at Celtic North for a year, and then I went to West Park, and it's probably the best move that I ever made, I think. But the two, the two coaches there, well, certainly the, the two main coaches, uh, Bert Brown and uh, Billy Harvey, who, unfortunately, have passed away, yeah. were really key fagger, father figures for me. Uh, you know, I was getting a lot of racial abuse round the pitch, you know, and even when I was just running out in the game as well, and, you know, coming for Postal, you, you sort of wanted to fight all the time and handle yourself, which uh, they just said, listen, Kevin, you're going to just ruin yourself and ruin your career 
you know, you've got a real chance of becoming a footballer. Uh, what you have to do is just understand that they're doing that to try and put you off your game and you have yeah. to make sure that you're, you're, you rise above that. And, you know, I think for, for them and, you know, I, I came from a, a poor, I was, you know, a, a poor, poor family. We didn't have a lot, we didn't have, my mum didn't have a lot of money. Uh, and they looked after us and they, they helped to buy football, buy, buy football boots and uh, also, you know, buy, you know, my fees and stuff and uh, get me to get me to, to tournaments. So, you know, for me, I'm, I'll be ever indebted to, uh, forever indebted to them. And what was Hutchie Vale like as well? Was that a, was that a really good learning experience? I think, I think for me, Hutchie Vale was, was a bit... I didn't really enjoy it, if I'm honest, right. in the sense that you were winning 8 10 now all the time, you know, so you, you weren't really getting that that competition, we were that good, you know, so so for me it was, I, I went there, I believe, Alec, uh, Alec Miller told me to go there because he was, he was scared that Celtic were going to come in and, and take right. me because I had been playing with, with Celtic Boys Club at that time, but mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the day, I, I done it, I was, I was signed for Hibs, he felt it was the best thing for me. For me, I was I was there. You know, I was scoring goals. I was playing really well. But you know, I would I probably have felt better if I was if I was back here. You know, in a better com- better competition. And that's that's purely for me. I don't think you learn anything when you're winning 10, 12 now each game. Yeah, definitely. Do you remember how the scouting process for Hibs worked? Well, I know I know certainly how how I get found out how I get found out we're playing uh, a tournament West Park we're playing a tournament at the fifty pitches at uh, Paisley yeah. just uh, just there uh, and Alec Miller was overwatching his son and he heard this commotion and in, in the other pitch just alongside it and it was me uh, playing really really well and doing well and he watched my, watched my game and then uh, he asked me to go I asked me to go in training and I was I was in training with him so I was training with Hearts. Dundee, Dundee United, so I was in, in Tottenham as well. So I was training for quite a few teams at that time uh, and my boys' club team. And I just felt that they had wanted me most. He came up to my house, uh, spoke to me, spoke to my mum, uh, and then, you know, went back down and his stereo had got stolen out of his car. Really? <laughs> yeah. So I thought, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to get signed here, but... Luckily, luckily, he, he signed it, and a couple, a couple of my mates had been, "Oh, was that that? Was that your manager coming up?" And I was like, "Yeah." And there was a few, a few choice words to be fair, and saying, "Listen, I could have, you could have bummed that deal for me there." <laughs> but fortunately enough, he, 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 he wanted to sign me. Brilliant. What were your youth team days like at Habs? It was, it was strange because I, I, I can't, I can't really remember playing many, many right. youth team games. That you know, when I went in in the YTS, I went in just. Uh, two weeks before my sixteenth birthday, and I had met, and then you know, in the, in the January, uh, and then I played a couple of reserve games, and before I knew it, the season was finished, and then I was into the following season, and I had made my debut. So yeah. you know, I was probably just over a, just over a year by the time you know I was seventeen when I when I made my my, my first team debut. You made your debut in nineteen ninety three at seventeen, and then a year later you scored your first goal at age eighteen. Do you remember who you scored your first goal against? Dundee United, That's Dundee right. United at what home. Do you, uh, you remember about it? Uh, just remember, I was I came on as a sub. Came on as a sub, I think, and I think it was uh, Michael O'Neill. I think it played me through Michael O'Neill or Gareth Evans. I think it was. Uh, I came in from we were shooting up, we were shooting up the slope. I'm sure, uh, and I came in from the the left hand side uh, and slipped it under the keeper. I can't remember who it was. Can't remember the keeper, but you know, I, I, that it took me. It took me a while. I get I get injured, you know, in the, the first season, and that was probably the story of of my career, really. You know, uh, 30, 13 years at thirteen years I, I played, and uh, thirteen operations, football operations. So when I when I when, when I break it down, it was one a year. So I done all right to get to just over three hundred odd games. Definitely. That Hibs team at that time as well, there was a lot of good players in it, but would you say there was a lot of kind of tough characters? Like, what was the culture like at that time? I, I, th- I think it was, I certainly, I certainly remember the ground staff anyway, you know, even though it was, you know, when I went in and having to run the lines and just getting booted and kicked all over the place. Uh, but I always remember my first training session with the first team and Alec Miller shouting me over and, you know, you get the jelly leg syndrome, you know, running across because you're going in, a, in with the first team. And I, I can't remember if it was Graham Mitchell uh, I slid tackle and went over the ball way and he wasn't happy. I, I know that. And 
for the rest of that session, I get booted up and down the pitch. Mm-hmm. You know, the training, the training game. But you know, I, I think the culture was really, it was really good. We had Pat McGinley there, you know, Gordon Hunter, uh, Tam McIntyre, Budgie, Budgie Burridge was there, and then you know, Keith Wright, Darren Jackson, so you know, Mike O'Neill, Mickey Weir. You know, I could go on and on. Brian Hamill and they done. He was probably the, the only defensive person there. Davey Farrell as well. Uh, Graham Mitchell was as I said, Willie Miller. So I think, I think then it was a really, really good side. It was a really, really attacking side. And, but I also think that if you look at, if you ask a Hibs, Hibs fan, what about good teams? I don't think your team would end up be anywhere near it. And that's just because I, I think, you know, we we were attacking, we were, we were adventurous, but it's just one of the ones where it's probably not a noticeable team, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. considering, you know, we had Willie Miller on one side, Graham Mitchell, right and left back, who we were attacking. We had uh, Pat McGinley centre midfield with Mickey Weir, Kevin McAllister, uh, obviously Mike O'Neill, then myself, Darren Jackson, uh, Keith Wright, Tony Ruggie was there as well. You know, so when you when you look at that, and I'll, pro- I'll probably missed a few as well. But when you think of that attacking, Gareth Evans was there as well. So when you think of that and you look at it, that's pretty pretty attacking. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a pretty attacking team. It was only really Davy Farrell or Brian Hamilton that would would be the defensive mm-hmm. players. Uh, but no, it was a, it was a, it was good for me. I think it was good for me because there was a lot of a lot of guys for, for Glasgow that came through. You know, and and I jumped in I jumped in the car school with them even when I when I couldn't drive, and it was it was really good. You know, it was it was a really good experience for me if I'm if I'm honest with you. Brilliant. You mentioned there about Alec Miller. Just how much of an influence was was Alec in your career? I think he was. A, I think he was. A, he's. He's. A, he was a big. He's always going to be a big influence in my career. He made. He gave me his debut. He, he put his trust in. Trust in me. You know, I was. I was disappointed when he got the sack uh, because I think we were sitting. We were sitting third or fourth when he got the yeah. sack in the league. You know, and and I know a lot of Hibs fans will say he was he wasn't attack minded, but I'll just re- round off yeah. a team that I was involved in that you know. But at the end of the day, the, the, the club made the decision. But for me, Alec Miller was incredibly incredibly knowledgeable about the game. You know, he watches games constantly, and it, still to this day, I can imagine him just being going to games or watching mm-hmm. games or you know just all the time. He just studies and studies and studies the game. And for me, he was really, really tactically aware, and I think that just shows where he went to after, after, yeah. after Hibs. You know, he became Rafa Benitez's his right hand man, pretty much. Uh, and you know, I, I'll be ever, forever grateful. I can't speak highly enough, Alec Mill. Yeah, brilliant. Obviously, after Alec got the sack, Jockey Scott got the job. What was your relationship like with Jockey? No, I had a, a good real relationship with Jockey. I thought, I thought he he came with some fresh ideas. Uh, it was, it was really, it was. It was good seeing it. Well, it, was, it wasn't good, obviously, seeing Alec Miller get the sack. But then, you know, I had only knew, I'd only known Alec Miller. So for me, it was it was something different. It was yeah. it was fresh. It was you know a different voice. All, all all the connotations that you have. But you know, I think Jockey only lasted three months or something. Uh, and I thought I thought he was I thought he was a good coach. He was a good coach with, with Alec Miller as well. But you know, I think the board obviously had other other plans, and that's. I, I know that now and I, I know it through my career, but then you're just a wee bit shocked to the change. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're a, you're a footballer to play football. You know, not you sit on the bench or not you want to play football week in, week out. Well, you should. Uh, and you just ride, ride the storm, really. You know, and just hope that your face fits. Mm-hmm. Jim Duffy gets a job after Jockey Scott. Like, was, was Jim, Jim Duffy was just kind of up and coming as a manager that time. Did you think he would he would do as well as he's done? Uh, no, I, th- I think yeah, I, I did, I did because I think he was at, he was at, I think he was at Chelsea before that or after that maybe. I think he was at Chelsea youth prior to the Hibs job, and I think Duff came in and you know, I, looking at it now, I might be totally wrong. I, I just this is my feeling on it. I think he probably changed the team a little bit too quickly. Right. You know, uh, he got rid of a lot of experienced players and, and he brought in real exciting players. You know, Chick Chandler was there. You know, uh, Basher was there as well. You know, and and I think that's for me. Just looking back on it, maybe if he had kept the the, the more the more experienced players, we might not get relegated. You know, but I think it was it was some journey. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, top of the league at, at, at New Year, about second top, I think, or top of the league at New Year, and then you know the the disappointment again, <laughs> relegated. Right. You know, a couple four months later. You know, so 
in in that sense, it was. I think it was it was a turbulent. It was a great it was a great time. I think, but it was a real turbulent time as well. And you know, and that's just my opinion. You know, if if I spoke to Duffy, he might say it very differently. But just me looking at it now is is like a wee bit older. You know, well certainly a, a lot older. Uh, and just a bit more mature. I think probably that's what happened. But I might be wrong. You mentioned there about like a chick channel and that. There must have been some good stories for that time in the dressing room and things like that. Is there anything that kind of sticks out to you? I think every story that Chick <laughs> was involved in, you know, I think he's, I think he, I think he's told. I mean, Basha were real, real. It was, it was crazy. You know, some of the stories that, that Chick and Basha were about. But I think Chick just used to take the piss out of Basha, and Basha just used to accept it. You know, and and that was. Chick was, I think you were guaranteed with Chick, you were either gu- you were guaranteed you were going to smile at training. Mm-hmm. You know, no matter what, there was always something happening, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, he's a he's a maverick of the game, Chick, you know. And I think that's what he brought. And I think he des- I think he really deserved his time at Hibs, if I'm honest. Yeah. And it was short because I think what he had done through the game, I think so many people wanted, probably wanted to take him, but were just too scared of. What he, what he was and couldn't handle him, whereas Duff was good pals with him and he knew him and he could handle him. You know, and I, I think I always, it always reminds me of Paul Merson when I was at yeah. Portsmouth with, with Harry Redknapp. You know, they were, they were, he was a maverick as well and, you know, Harry let Mercer away with a lot of stuff that he wouldn't let anybody else away with and I think that was the yeah. same with Jim and, and Jack. You know, and I think you have to just deal with that, you know, as a, as a player and you, you just hold your hands up and say, you know what, yeah, these, you know, check sort of, think ran the show for up until Christmas time, you know, and then he probably ran out of legs in, in a sense, you know, of of just being overwhelmed with how well he was playing and keeping that consistency because I think I don't think a chick would probably have ever played as well as he had played for that first part of the season. He was unbelievable. And I think he got injured as well over that over that time. And I think Chick was one of the players where, you know, the more they played, the better he got. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was that was a consistent first part of the season. He was he was unplayable at times, unplayable. Yeah, yeah definitely. You know, and it's 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 crazy to think that that's probably his his, his biggest club. No, I know it's weird when you say that because obviously he'd, he'd done really well at Hibs, but he, like he'd so much ability to maybe go to that kind of old firm, like yeah. to, to sell to. Do you think he, he was good enough to do that? I think he was. Yeah, I think he was. Did he? He was he, ability wise, certainly. Did they have the professionalism that? Celtic right. probably wanted and, and could handle. Probably not, I don't think. You know, and that's not me saying that he's not he's not wasn't professional, but I just think the way that they would have to he would have had to have been there, I don't think that was Chick. You know, I think you would have lost so much with Chick with that. You know, so I think there's it's almost two worlds collide have to be, you know, in the same in the same area in the same time, you know, crossing at the same the same path to to get the best out of them. And I think Duff's done that. Yeah, definitely. That 97-98 season, you did a brilliant start to that season. Obviously, the win against Celtic will stick out. And then 16 games without a win. Like, What was your memories of the, the start, particularly that game against Celtic? I think, I think the, the start was just mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing. I think it was real, real entertainment. It was real entertainment. Uh, it was play beyond play. You know, I, I think we were probably... The best team in the league at that up to that point where we were. If we were, I think I'm pretty sure we were sitting top yeah. in that time. Uh, and you know, we were simply we were simply the, the best team and in the league at that point. And then just the wheels came off. I think we, we got injuries, you know, a loss a, a bit of loss of confidence, you know, probably there was a wee bit of you know resentment to certain th- certain things that was happening. And you know, that's when changing rooms can can go, I don't. I don't ever think that I can't even I can't remember that Duff lost the change room or the boys were like, ah, he's this, he's that, we don't want to play for him. I can't can never remember that. I might be, I might be, I might be wrong in that, but I can't I personally I can't remember that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think f- from the joy of the first first half of the season to the utter disbelief and you know shock again, relegating disappointment. And you know, for, for me it was seeing that was a, I always remember the f- first time. That was the first time we ever seen grown people cry at a football game. Yeah, you know, because I was I was suspended for the game that we get relegated. Re- we got relegated, and I remember being in the 
in the in the hospitality box and just seeing grown people crying and that was like just a shock and it's never left me since. Mm-hmm. Never left me me since. And unfortunately enough, you know, through my career, I've been I've been fortunate enough to have the high more highs than more low, than than lows like that certainly. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned there, obviously, Jim Duffy left and Alex McLeish come in. What was Alec McLeish like as a manager? Did you enjoy working with him? Uh, I, th- I think Alec was, he came in and he, he, he had his own, own way of working and his own, own way that he wanted, to, he wanted to play. You know, was I over enamoured about how he, how he was as a manager? Probably not, no. Mm-hmm. And I think the culmination of that was me getting sold. Mm-hmm. You know, I think... Uh, he'd say he'd said to me that my agent had said that I wanted to move, which was nonsense, you know. But and then I was I, I regret I, I, I to this day, you know, I, I regret moving. You know, I wanted I should have well not regret in the sense that I wanted to go to the Premiership. I wanted to play at the, the top level, but yeah. you know, I think it was just the way that it was done. You know, I was I came on against Clyde Bank in the, probably the third, second or third game of that season in the Champions, in well, the first division. Then uh, and we drew two each. And because I was suspended for the first two games, so I think it was a third game. And then that was on the Saturday, and I was away to Derby midweek. I'm sure we had a cup midweek game, and I got a phone call in the Sunday saying that Derby wanted to take me on trial. Went down on a Monday, and I was pretty much signed by the Thursday. Uh, and the biggest disappointment was not not being able to say a thank you to the fans, and you know because they had been with me through thick and thin. Yeah, the Hibs fans. Uh, and I was, I'll be honest, I was pissed off with Alec McLeish because what he had said to me was, I, I believe, wasn't true. But, you know, I think when I look back in it now, when I look back in it now and I've, I've got older, and I've got, not now, but, you know, as I got older, I was I, I was probably the only person that he could sell for money. Yeah. You know, to, to come and, you know, rebuild. And I probably didn't see, I didn't see it that, that way. I think if he came and said, listen, Kevin, I need to sell you to get money, that's the only way that I'm going. And I would have, I'd have dealt with that, I'd have been fine with it. But I think it was the fact that he'd said that my agent said that I wanted to move. And I, I hadn't, I hadn't, I didn't see that I was going to, going to be moving at all. But looking back on it as I, as I get older, that was me at 21, you know, 21, 22, just being a, just being a wee bam, if I'm honest, you know, and... Spit my, spit my dummy out of the pram, really. Aye. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, I went to a club in the Premier League, so, you know, it's, it was it was all good. And then, you know, Alan McLeish went and got Frank Sozzi and, you know, people like that. So, you know, I had, I'll had take I'll take, uh, I'll take the credit for getting promoted. Well, <laughs> how do you kind of look back in your spell at Hibs? Is there a lot of good memories? There's, yeah, there's a lot of good memories. I just think that... Uh, it will be a club that will always be close to my heart for yeah. the reason of making making my debut and being able to run out and you know a, a little boy for you know a slum really in Glasgow you know making it to to run out with his team and play against Celtic and Rangers and score against your local rivals the winner in a New Year's Day you know and and having a hand in stopping them winning step Hearts winning potentially winning the league as well. You know, so for for these things, I'll be eternally grateful for every single fan that shouted abuse at me, supported me, you know, cheered me. You know, I always, I always, always have have that no matter what. You know, and it's been a, it was a privilege, a privilege to pull on that jersey. You you spoke about before about the the abuse you got at the time when you were at Hibs. Was like see when you look see now like looking back at that was it how hard was it was it to take and how did you kind of deal with it? It was it was hard because I didn't feel as if I had any support from anyone. Right. If that makes sense, within the game, you know, I was a young, I was a young kid. I was, you know, I was eighteen, nineteen at the time. You know, and and the Hearts captain racially abusing me on a, on a pitch and the TV cameras bringing that seat, showing that, showing them doing that. Uh, the fans doing it as well. You know, you, you actually hear the fans and see it, uh, and that was just. That for me was the biggest, the biggest disappointment because it almost felt that just because I was a young kid making the, making my way in the game yeah. to the Hearts captain and a, a player that had played for played for Scotland that he, he was untouchable and I feel that nothing's really changed. I don't think it's changed that much up until now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've not made a stand on it, you know. We've not really put 
a, a pointer down and saying it's totally unacceptable. Yeah, we give it we give it lip service, but the elephant is always in the room because we're scared to talk about it. You know, and that's you know, twenty five years ago, twenty five years, twenty five plus years ago. You know, and that was that was a real disappointment for me. You know that nobody nobody took ownership of it, and I was only a kid. You know, yeah. I, I didn't have didn't have the balls to come out and stuff and that's that's on me you know I think if it was two years later then I certainly would have you know because I was always worried about if I come out and say that's what's going to happen to me am I going to get out of the team am I going to get you know you know put out and nobody's ever want to want to take me again or you know because I'm making you know get a name for yourself that you're making you're making waves you know and for the wrong reasons then I think for me that's a regret that I look back on now and, and go Okay, I was a young kid. I will never let that happen. And that day, that day, and that time, you know, I've vowed since since that day, you know, that I will never ever accept anybody giving me racist abuse without saying anything or or, or, or challenging it. Then that's what I've done. To, you know, I've stayed true to my word. Absolutely. You mentioned there about when you when you went to tr- uh, Derby and trial. Were you was there any other interest? Was there any other clubs kind of make noise? I obviously been relegated. Was a was it always a dream to try the Premier League? Was there any kind of Scottish clubs looking at you as well? No, I, I, I don't know, if I'm honest with you. You know, Derby came in and, I, you know, I, I think the Premier League for me was where you wanted to be. You know, I had saw people going down and I'd seen people coming back up. You know, and, and when Derby came in, you know, it was it was a huge club and, and working under Jim Smith and Steve McLaren and Steve Round, yeah. you know, was an opportunity that I don't think I could have turned down. You know, that's not to say that I wouldn't have stayed. You know, I wouldn't have stayed at Hibs if, if they'd made me an offer, you know, then because I, I was settled in Scotland. But I think for, for me as a person and it, as me as a footballer, I probably had to get out of Scotland. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to get out of Scotland and, and just go and, and find my own way, you know, because I was probably I was probably comfortable at Hibs. You know, I probably wasn't, probably wasn't being 100% true to me, you know, and, you know, I, and that's that's the thing, you know. Whereas when I went there, I felt as if I had to I had to go. It came up at the right time for me, you know. But the circumstances were, were wrong, if that makes sense, as as of 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 alluded to earlier. Yeah. Uh, but I think going down there was was a real eye opener for me, you know, because I went down there is is probably one of the fastest, if not the fastest, players in Scotland. And I went down there, and I, I went from rapid to just being really quick. You know, yeah. and and people were physically stronger. You never yeah. saw them in the gym. You know, training with tempo was incredible as well. You know, and I remember going into the cha- going into the, the training ground and thinking, "What is this? This is they had uh, a seven aside pitch that they only used on a Friday. Uh, they had the baseball ground as well. They'd be done the shape and shaping and, and team play on a Thursday. Uh, the, a, a large training ground." You know, an inside gym uh, with a, an astro, an astro pitch. Uh, although, although it was probably you know the early astro. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, a big, large shed with just uh, vibration seats, loads of vibration seats where you went before training. Uh, you had the guy come up from London to do different stuff, Cybex stuff, and all that with you. So it was like just night and day. It was night and day. I remember thinking, wow. And going into the, going into the car park and seeing Ferrari F1 Spiders, can uh, Aston Martins M3s, all that. And you know the previous week I had been getting a lift through in Pat McGinley's Pat McGinley's Hugo. You know, <laughs> and you go to Derby and you're like, wow, what is what is this? So you know, it was it was it was intimidating. It was intimidating. You know, but ultimately, you know, I went and showed what I could do. You know, did I, I get did I get the chance that did I get did I get enough chances to show what I could do? I don't think so. Did I deserve more chances? I think the way that I was doing in training, I think certainly, yeah. But, you know, that was the way it went. That was the way it went. I had no, I have no qualms on, on Jim Smith. I had no, you know, God rest him, Steve McLaren, Steve Brown, nobody. I learned so much from them. And I can, I'm eternally, I'm grateful for, for that experience. Yeah. Because I think it, it made me a, a better person and a better player. Yeah, what was your relationship like with, with the likes of Jim Smith and Steve McLaren? Were they were they good kind of man managers as well? Yeah, yeah, they were good. You know, I, I went to Steve McLaren a lot to, to find out what I could do to get in the team. You know, I spoke to Jim Smith as well. You know, and I think I think 
I think the thing for, for me was Jim Smith was, you never really saw Jim. You saw him on a Monday and then you saw him on a Thursday and a Friday and then obviously the game. But Steve McLaren done the majority of the stuff along with Steve Brown. And, you know, for me it was, Jim Smith was just like, this, the bald eagles, like, wow, a legend of the game. And then Steve McLaren's just ahead of his time, you know, coming up. And then you've got Steve Brown too, who was like a miniature version of Steve McLaren, if that makes sense, a younger, but with the same ideas, but you know, just really, really engaging people, you know, and, and you know, that's that's all I, that's the biggest compliment that I can give them all, you know, that I learned so much, you know, that was the first, you know, I learned so much tactically from Alec, McLe- uh, Alec Miller, sorry, mm-hmm. and then to go down there and, and see it again in a different way with, with top players, you know, because the Derby team that I played in had... Igor Stamak in it, it had Mark Poom in it, uh, Stefani Rani, Chicho Bayano, Paolo Wonchot, mm. you know, so there was, was pro- Jakob Larson, uh, so there was Lars Bikinen, there was proper players in it, you know, Dion Burton was there, Daryl Powell, uh, Rory De Lapp, yeah. you know, people that were, that are, you know, household names probably down there, so, you know, for, for me to go down there and, and go head, head to head with these people was, was fantastic. Brilliant. Who... Oh, who were the, some of the hardest players you played against in the Premier League? I think, I think for me, Dennis Irwin was the hardest player that I right, played okay. against, and, and Nigel Worthing, uh, Nigel Worthington, just uh, uh, up against each other, up against. Uh, sorry, Nigel Winterburn. Sorry, yeah. uh, they were the, they were the two toughest. You know, going you know position to position. Dennis Irwin was so quick. He was so strong. You know, mm-hmm. he was he would take you the other way as well. You know, so for me, he's probably the the, the the best player that I've played against, the toughest player. But you know, when you when you're when you're there, you you know, I played against John Terry, I played against Stephen Gerrard. I remember Stephen Gerrard, I think he made his debut, but it was one of his early early games. You know, he came on as a sub at, at Derby. And I remember sitting thinking, Wow, who is this kid? Yeah. He's just he just went he just went on the pitch and he's just ran the show. Actually ran the show, demanding the ball right, left and centre. You know, and, and I remember that's probably one of the only people that I've sat back and you know, is is an opposition and went wow, wow for just a young kid, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but you know, you, you you look at it and you 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 play in it, play against Beckham, Giggs, you know, schools. You see all them, John Terry's, you know, Gerard obviously, you know, Paul Ins, Jamie Redknapp, Michael Owen Fowler, you know, all these people just wow, wow, you know, they were. You, you can see how good you, you actually see how good they are up close. I know they look good on on the TV, but I think in, in live live playing against one two, you see how much space they they have, and you you wonder why and how they get that space. Yeah, definitely. You scored at Anfield in a two one one for Derby. Was that one of your favourite memories of your career? That was yeah. That was that was my first ever start for Derby. Mm-hmm. That that game and I always remember the week leading up to it, we had a lot, a lot of injuries and people were saying we were going to just get absolutely smashed. You know, and, and I, I think of the I think of the team there, Paul Ince played, Jamie Redknapp played, Patrick Berger played, Fowler played, uh, Mike Cavone played, Bjornaby played, uh, David James in goals. Uh, I'm not sure if McManaman was I think McManaman was there as well. I think he played as well. You know, and going in, going into and the Anfield was all, always a tough, no matter where they are in the league, you know. And, and for me to to score, I think it was something like eight, 12 minutes into my debut, you know, was 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 brilliant, <laughs> was brilliant in front of the pop as well, you know. And and that's that you you look back and 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 smile, you know, every time it comes up because it's a special, special moment, you know. And I, I can I can say to my my son and my kid, my my son and my girls that you know your dad. Play that played there and they scored there, you know, and I and I can find it in YouTube somewhere and, and show them it, you know, and uh, my wee man now now believes that I did I did play football instead of just going <laughs> yeah dad no you no you don't you just talk nonsense. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes, the first season, your first season at Derby, you finished eighth in the Premier League. But how successful yeah. a season was that? That's the best finish. That was the highest yeah. finish in the league. You know, so it, it was successful. It was successful for the club. It was successful for me. I think I I made about thirty, nearly 40, 40 odd appearances. Don't get me wrong. I think every single one of them, apart from probably two, were for the bench, and they were only for like five or ten minutes. So, 
you know, when you when you look back now, I think I made probably one. I was up there with the most appearances that season. Well, you know, but as I say, uh, I think on time I was probably the worst, <laughs> and that's including the, that's including the people that got like you know were only on the on the, on the pitch for like maybe four or five games. They probably beat me in time, uh, but I beat them in appearances. <laughs> but no, it was it was it was fantastic. As I say, you know, playing and training alongside their players. Yeah, you know that I've mentioned was was incredible. You know because it, it it showed me that the level the level that they have, you know, and they, they must be doing it doing things differently because as I say, I, I never ever saw them in the gym. You know whether they were away at home and in the gym, you know I don't know, but you know they were all absolute machines and could run all day. You know yeah. the bleak test was ridiculous. Was it? Yeah, just ridiculous. Who won it? <sighs> I think Mark Poom was up there, the goalkeeper was up there. Was, so he, was, he, was, he, was he the Estonian? Was he the guy that scored the overhead kick? Uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But he was the Estonian keeper, he was just like built like Dolph Lundgren. So he was, <laughs> that's, what, that's what he was like. He was just like, for a goalkeeper, you know, I was I was used to seeing some different goalkeepers, but he right. was like, wow, wow. How did you enjoy Walsall and Moan? I really did enjoy it. I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I, it was a, it was a really good club. Ray Graydon was a manager. He was a really good manager. Uh, they felt I felt that it was a, it was a real good move at the time for me. Uh, I hadn't been playing at Derby, you know, and as, as I said, right at the early early parts of this, I'm a footballer to play football, not to sit on the bench. Mm-hmm. You know, I always wanted to play, and when when Walsall came in, I had no hesitation in going and. You know, I enjoyed, I enjoyed my, my time there, my short time there. I was there for, I think, uh, three months maybe, uh, over the Christmas period, might not even have been three months, but, you know, uh, and it was it was fantastic. You know, it was, a, it was a real, it was a real good club. It was a real, you know, family club. You know, there was good play, there was good players there. Jimmy Walker was there, Dean Keats was there, Darren Rack. You know, there was good players, good, good legends of the, legends of that club mm-hmm. were there. And, you know, they... They brought you in perfectly, you know, and they welcomed you in as well. You know, that was the most important thing. And, and for me, it was about f- playing, you know, because I had yeah. had been used to playing, you know, or, or at least at least at Hibs when I, when I wasn't playing, it was either because I was injured or I was coming back for injury or it was like one game and then I was back in. Mm. Uh, but at Derby, it was like I was in and then I was out and then I was in for one game and then I was out and for, for a long time, you know, and as I say, that. Right, they, they stats are uh, playing about 30, 40 games. I think I probably only started maybe three or four of them after that. After that. So for me, it was week in, week out, playing week in, week out, which was which was fantastic. Obviously, you moved to Portsmouth after that. Tony Pulis takes you to po- uh, Portsmouth. How excited were you to work with him? It was it was it was strange because I, I didn't really I didn't really know much about him or the club. Right. To, if I'm honest with you, when when they came in, uh, uh, when I went down to to talk to them. Uh, Milan manager who's the chairman Tony was there as well and, and Tony sold the club to me uh, and for me people like Tony they don't like him but for me he's he's probably one of the best managers that I've worked under and the best guys that I've worked under uh, I think he's I think he's straight down the, straight down the middle he certainly was with me and you know he he saw he made me see the game in a, a very different light and you know don't get me wrong, was his, was his training. We we done the same thing near enough day in day out, and it was it was boring. It but it was tough. It was mm-hmm. tough as well. You know, I certainly I certainly knew the defensive side and the attacking side of my position under Tony Pulis, whereas I only wanted to do the attacking side. But I was quite willing to do the defending side. Uh, but he sold the club in Milan, so really were trying to get to which was which was good. And and you know they wanted me they wanted me there. You know, I, I would I would play, which was again the most important thing for me. Uh, and you know, I, I made the move. You know, which I felt was a good move for me. You know, I, I was getting out of Derby because I wasn't playing. Yeah. You know, although I was on Walsall at Walsall, if I hadn't I moved to Walsall, then I probably wouldn't have went to Portsmouth. I don't think they would have probably came in. You know, I had done well at Walsall, uh, and the move to Portsmouth was was the right the right thing at the right time. Yeah, your first season was was a, a kind of mixed bag. Obviously, uh, Tony Pulis left, and Steve Claridge and Graham Rex came in as well that season. What was your memories of your first season? First season, it was 
the memory of the first season was the fans, I think. Right. You know, because I, I remember I remember going down I think I signed in the February or the the January or the February. And I remember it being sunny for the first two weeks and thinking, walking about in shorts and t-shirt, thinking, wow, this is so far different from Scotland. Mm-hmm. I always remember thinking that and I remember the first game, the fans just chanting for the whole first half without without stopping. And then going in the changing room and coming back out and then them singing again the whole and thinking, what the I've never seen that I've never seen anything like this. You know, for you know, thirteen thousand fans, they made the the hairs in the back of your neck stand up. You know, and it was a mixed bag. It was a mixed bag. I think uh, when Tony Tony get the sack, I felt that some of the players didn't have his back. Mm-hmm. Obviously Steve Cla- Steve Claridge went into the chairman and stabbed him in the back. Which I didn't, I didn't like, you know. When I when I found out, and then he got the he got the job for three months, and he got the sack, which which I think he deserved. He well, he did deserve. There's no no question about it. Uh, I think if you if you stab somebody in the back, then you don't deserve to be anywhere near the football club. Uh, and that's that's what happened. And then Graham Ricks came in, and I think Ricksy gave a bit of fresh air to everyone. You know, I think his philosophy and the way he wanted to play. Jim Duffy was obviously his assistant as well, so yeah, I knew, I knew right, Duff. Yeah. You know, I knew Duff there, uh, and and Rixie, good Rixie was a good cop. Duff was a bad cop. You know, but I think the way Rixie wanted you to play, he probably didn't have the players to play the way he did. You know, and and I think that's the biggest factor. And then I think obviously Prozaneki came in, which was. Just like what was he like? He was a, a amazing player, but a a colourful character to say the least. He's, he's just I, I'm, I've got nothing. I've got nothing but you know amazement that I sit here, you know, and think that I played alongside Robert Prozanek. Uh, you know, a guy that played was Croatia's golden boy, played for Barcelona, Real Madrid, one of the, probably the best players in the world at his time. Yeah, and I was on a football pitch watching. Him. Uh, just a pretty shit team, you know. Was, and he was he was still running the show. Aye, uh, you was know, a colourful uh, character as well. Was there a lot of kind of good memories in the, the dressing and things like that? Yeah, well, he, he just smoked all the time. You know, he just <laughs> went out. He had listened to what Rexy said, and then went and had a, had a cigarette, and then just came back in and you know went and played. You know, I I, I tell this story all the time. You know, I remember running up the line one day and shouting Robbie, 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 and He's just like comes in at half time. He says, "Kevin, you don't need to shout." I see you. He just done that, and I was like, "Okay, Robbie, I'll never ever shout at you again." <laughs> and I'll just, I'll just run, and you can just put the ball. But you know, he's just. He knew if you were making a run, that he was going to put the ball yeah. exactly where it was, exactly at the right pace. You know, and he he done this, he done this drag that you know you knew he was going to do it, but he still bought it. You know, mm-hmm. like, he he could. He could tell you, he, he would tell, I, I seen him doing it against Barnsley and then he puts the ball in the bottom corner, scores a hat-trick, he was raging because we, we drew four each, but <laughs> he went one way and then dragged the ball the other way. That was two players went that way and then he done it again and the three players bought it and then he just shifted that on his left foot and put it in the bottom corner. And I, remember, I, remember, I remember being on the pitch just going, standing watching this and thinking, wow, wow, these boys have bought that and I, I swear... So he could he could actually come up to you and say that listen Kevin I'm going to do this to anybody and you would still have bought it <laughs> You'd still still bought it it's just incredible that's that's you know Robbie that's, I've got so much pride in, in, when I speak about Robbie and so much so much happiness comes you know and that he, he was such a such a such a good player and such a nice guy as well. Brilliant. Who were some of the other good players that were there at that time before Red Map came on? Uh, before then, that Mark Butchel was there. Yeah. Mike Crouchy was there as well. Uh, it's probably probably the, the the ones that most people would remember. Uh, you know, Mark Butchel. I thought he had a difficult time down there. He done his cruise as well, yeah, which was that. really unfortunate. You know, he was it was it was weird how he done it as well because he was just he was running. Robbie was running uh, up the pitch, and Mark just went across him and clipped, He clipped him. He clipped him and. He done his he done his cruise yet, but you know, Butchie was a was a top top player. You know, good goal scorer, big Crouchy as well was was sensational that season. I think he scored something like seventeen goals, seventeen goals in his first season. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
signed him for a like say I think signed him for a million and then you know he gets sold for five point five million and no. the the rest is the rest is history as they say. No, definitely. Harry Redknapp gets a job. What was your what was your first impressions of Harry Redknapp? I, th- I think I think for for me it was it was more that I think we I think we all knew when when he came in that Rixie was getting the sack at some point. Yeah, you know, and that was that was a that was disappointing. You know, obviously Sean Berry's came out and said that's why he didn't stay because of the way Rixie was treated. Uh, but I think when when he came when Harry came in, I didn't really know what, I didn't really know you know where I would fit in the team or mm-hmm. if I would get in the team. And then the fact that he was bringing in. Steve Stone, Matt Taylor, Gianluca Festa, Ariane Dezou, you know, uh, yeah. Shaka Hislop, you know, these players before, and then Mers came in, and then Todd, Todorov came in, uh, and you just thought to yourself, wow, you know, how, I certainly felt like, wow, how am I getting in this team? I'm not getting in this team. Uh, and the, the close season, I made, a real, I made a real decision that I was, going to, I was going to become as fit as I could be, as fit as I ever was and I was going to make sure that if I was called up on then I was going to be ready uh, and that was my that was my attitude you know I, I think when I went into pre-season I felt that if I was struggling you know for fitness wise or I felt as if I needed to get fit then I would go and mark you know Steve Stone in the game or Matt Taylor bits of side or stuff then I would go mark Mers you know if I wanted to if I wanted to do a bit of defending then I would go and mark Yakubu uh, and that's the way that I felt that season and, and thankfully for me it worked the first I wasn't even in the squad for the first two games uh, and I was fortunate enough that Steve Stone got injured and played then I played I get in Gianluca Festa got injured as well uh, I played right wing back for half the season and I remember the, the, the half the season the fans booing my name when it was getting called out in the team sheet uh, Boone when I got a touch of the ball, when I played the ball uh, that whole first half of the season. Uh, but I think I think for me it was the manager, the players, Merce as well, Steve Stone, even though he wasn't playing, just going, listen, Kevin, you're doing a fantastic job for the yeah. team. The boys know what you're doing. Uh, for them, you know, there's you're doing something that other people aren't doing. Uh, and that was a that was a big boost. That was a big boost because it's not nice getting your getting your name booed when you were coming out and then the second half of the season, uh, Steve Stone came back and Matt Taylor got injured and Harry put me to left wing back. Uh, and by the end of the season, the fans were singing my name, chanting my name. Yeah. So, uh, so there was a real turnaround. And, and I think the biggest compliment I get from that is Alan Knight, the legendary Portsmouth goalkeeper, who's wrote in his book that I'm the only person he's ever, ever known to change the fans' perception. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a big accolade. You know, I think I'm probably a wee bit of a cult hero down there for reasons unknown to myself. But you know, I think I think when I was at Portsmouth, I think I played every position mm-hmm. apart from goalkeeper. You know, <laughs> and I think that shows the versatility of I wasn't I wasn't the most skillful player, but I think what I what I gave what I gave was a hundred percent effort and work rate. And I think the the players realised that. You know, the manager realised that, and ultimately the fans eventually realised that. Yeah, Paul Merson must have been some character. Yeah, Merson was. I think there's there's two there's two players that of I go wow at, and one's obviously obviously Robbie. He's mm-hmm. the best player that I've ever played played alongside. But Paul Merson is one of the is is the only player that I've ever saw actually change a club, yeah. actually change a full club. And that season, Mers was. Just incredible, incredible for a guy that is so left-footed. You know, he plays everything with it outside his foot. He doesn't really play it with his right foot. I think for, for what he done for the club, and I think the chairman has to get credit for it as well, yeah. Milan, because he put his money where his mouth was, you know, and, and I think that's the journey. That was the journey I was fortunate enough to see the journey in the sense of staying up the last game of the season. You know, under under Rixie, and then getting getting promoted to the Premier League. You know, I, I went on that journey, and it was Mers just galvanised the whole city. Probably, you know, Portsmouth itself was. He just turned the club right around. He was he was the X factor that we had because mm-hmm. I think there was there was many great players in that team. There was many many great players, 
uh, and household names. Uh, but he was the one that just no matter what, he was captain fantastic. You know, he was genuinely the top man, you know, and he would work his socks off, you know. Yeah, there was games where he probably wouldn't get a ball, but he would still, he'd still make something happen. You knew no matter what, no matter what position you were in, there was always a chance when he got the ball that something was going to happen. And nine times out of ten, it did happen. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's what happened with the players that we believed if the other team scored four, we would score five or six. And that's just the way, that's just the way it was. Brilliant. What happened when you when you get promoted? Like what happened to was that kind of talk of you staying or did you were you desperate to try the Premier League again? Uh, no, I, I stayed for I stayed for a bit, but mm. then again, you know, I wasn't playing. I wasn't oh. playing, I wasn't getting game time. Uh, and I felt that a move was going to be the best. I went out and loan at Norwich and yeah. you know, I was part of part of that league winning team as well. So, you know, and I think working under Nigel Worthington there as well was was a real eye opener as well. He was like attention to detail was was incredible. You know, he was different from Harry in the sense that Harry built teams. He built teams. Harry built teams and made you feel the best player on the planet. You know, and I think that's his his biggest attribute, Harry. Yeah, tactically he was he was good, but you know, Nigel Wellington had everything to, you know, the the point. Every single thing, everything that you could think of, he would probably have thought about it mm-hmm. and had the option. And he was a real good, real good manager. And I was in uh, in Norwich was a fantastic club. I went there with with uh, Crouchy as well. Yeah. Crouchy was he went there on, on loan for Aston Villa, I'm sure. Uh, so he played up up top with, with Darren Huckerby. You know, Paul McBay was there. Uh, Adam, uh, what's Adam saying name again? Uh, Adam Drury was there. You know, we had uh, Rob Green was there as well. And so we had a, a really good side there. And I was part and parcel with that. You know, and I really enjoyed my time at Norwich. And, you know, I think he was going to sign, but I got injured just, you know, at the last bit there. And I think that was a, probably the story of my career. You know, and then I, and then I went back to Portsmouth, went on loan to Leicester. Carlisle. Carlisle. Eh, no, Leicester. Leicester, that's right. Went there, got injured again. I was only there for a month. Yeah. And then went up to Carlisle. I got injured again uh, after about three I was there for three months got injured after two months came back uh, and no that was when I was at Stoke sorry I went to Leicester and then went back to went back to Portsmouth and then Tony Pulis came and signed me at Stoke and Stoke was a was a disaster for me if I'm honest with you uh, in the sense the club was fantastic the club yeah. was fantastic and uh, the players were really good as well. Really good, really good setup. Really, really family club. Tony was was great. Michael Dubery was there. Yeah. Steve Simonson was there. Dave Bramer was there. Ricardo Fuller was there. You know, so it was really, really good, good players there. But you know, for me, it was I just had so many injuries there, mm-hmm. one after the other. You know, and yeah. I think that was, I think one season, I think I only played about ten games or something. Yeah. Uh, and it was just, it was just, it was just one, it's just one of the ones that. You know, just broke down constantly, you know, yeah. in, in the injury front. Yeah. Johan Boskamp went was at Stoke yeah. as well. How did you find him? I I, I liked his I liked his methods, you know. Mm-hmm. I think so what the, first... if you ask any like any kind of Dutch expert, they say he's brilliant. Yeah, he was he was he was he was really, really good. I really enjoyed his coaching. Uh, I think it was probably the easiest preseason, right? But tough as well. Yeah. It was like loads and loads of possession. I don't think I can't I can't really remember his do I think we've done some runs, but it wasn't it was mostly all with the ball. Yeah. Very good, very, very good coach. Really enjoyed working under him. Uh, really astute. And I think for me, he gave me something different as well. You know, just that method methodology of how to play the game and how he wanted to play the game and how he coached the game as well mm-hmm. was 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 good. You know, so although although Stoke was as Disaster for me personally in a playing front. I think I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about the game as well because mm-hmm. I certainly watched enough of them up the stand. <laughs> Tony Pulis as well. Obviously, you 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 reunited with him and obviously came back after Boss Camp left. Like, how big was he for your career like on on the park and off the park? I, th- I think I think it was it was huge, and I still speak to him to this day. Uh, I think he was. I think he really showed the belief that in me that previous managers probably didn't. Like mm-hmm. Jim Smith when I was at Derby probably didn't trust me enough 
you know, at Hibs, I, I, as I say, I was probably getting just accepting of I was going to play week in, week out. You know, and I never really wanted that. And I think for Tony, I would have ran through a brick wall and I've done that. I've done that as well. You know, played when I probably shouldn't have played. I, I, I know when I got my ankle operation, you know, I was, I should have got it like probably six weeks before. Because after every single game, my ankle was swollen up. I had two cortisone injections in it as well. Uh, and I probably needed it. But, you know, because it was Tony, I wanted to play. Mm -hmm. I wanted to play, you know, and that was that was just my type of character. I wanted to play all the time, whether it was, you know, even even with strains, I would try and rush myself back. And it was more probably detrimental to me. And that's probably why I, I, I never played as many games as as possible because as soon as I felt that it was better, I would go and say, yeah, it's fine. And then I'd break down again rather than give it mm -hmm. the correct time to, to heal. But, you know, I think I think for Tony, for me, is, as I said earlier, him as a man and as a person for me, for me, is a, it was a godsend in the sense that, you know, he gave me he gave me the belief that I could go and play. You know, he gave me the opportunity to play with big clubs that I probably would never have played with. You know, and I think he I showed his faith in me, taking me to Stoke. Although it didn't work out, and we we had we had a fallout at, at the at the end at the end come the end of it. Uh, but you know, still a hundred percent speak to him and still get his advice and. Will always look for his advice if, and he's always at the end of the phone, which is always nice. Brilliant. Obviously, after you, you leave Stoke, you, you move back to Scotland with Dunfermline. Like, was it always a was it always a plan to kind of finish your career at, in Scotland? No, no, it wasn't. No, I, I, I get I get offered I got offered a year deal at Walsall. And, yeah. uh, they were humming and hawing about, you know, it took a while because when I went, when I when I went to when I left Stoke, when I just before I had went to Stoke, I'd, I'd went to Walsall and we had we won the we won the league that year. And I'd helped him I helped him win the league. So I played some like 12, 13 games, I think that that season with Walsall. And fortunately enough, that's probably the longest I got that season. <laughs> 13 games I run and I've not been injured. So I don't know, I don't know. Maybe it was a water in Stoke, it was a wee bit different for, for uh, Walsall water. I don't know, I don't know what it was, but uh, I went there and you know, under Richard Mooney and, and we won it, we won the we won the league and you know he was saying that we, we wanted to sign me and, and and all that and I was like that's fine you know and uh, I would be happy to stay but you know Dunfermline offered me a two year contract they mm -hmm. only offered me a one uh, it took forever to offer me it and I, I just felt a wee bit you know he was pissing about a wee bit the club were pissing about and I went you know what you've you've had your opportunity you know I'll, I'll go to I'll go to Dunfermline I liked I liked the players that were there. I mm -hmm. thought we had a real good chance of, of winning the league. Uh, I didn't know much about Stephen Kenny at the time, uh, but you know I, I think the the players that were there, Stephen Glass was there, Andy Kirk was there, uh, Scott Wilson, Greg Shields, uh, Craw Stevie Crawford was there as well. You know, so I, I think for me, I'm looking at it and going, yeah, we can we can certainly get promoted and. You know, we got off to a terrible, terrible start, and mm -hmm. you know, it was probably it was probably one of the ones where we knew we weren't going to get relegated, but I think we knew we weren't going to win the league because I think I think we didn't win in the first five or something, five or six games, I think. Uh, and I think for me, Stephen Kenny it was it was difficult to you know I think he was new to the job as well, so yeah. there was huge pressure on him coming over for Ireland. Uh, I think he had huge, huge pressure on him on his shoulders because I think he wanted to he wanted to show what he had and he deserved it. And because I think people were just like, "Who's this guy coming over for Ireland? He's done really well in Ireland." You know, and you know what? You know what Scottish people, Scottish fans are like. They don't really give foreign yeah. <laughs> foreign managers, a, well, you know, foreign managers a chance. And and I think I think he struggled that first season. And there was a lot of big characters in the changing room as well. You know, myself included in that, uh, and there was probably when we got to that point where we knew we were probably not going to win the league and we weren't going to, going to get relegated. It was really difficult to, certainly for me, to motivate myself. You know, in in that uh, getting up and, and training at the training ground because you know we had a, we all due respect to Dunfermline at that time. They were training at Petrivia. I was used to you know training and you know some. Some really nice yeah. training grounds and uh, bowling green stuff, and you know, but that was down to me as well, not just them. You know, I had chose to go there, 
So, you know, I sort of let myself down as well as them. But, you know, I, I again, injuries, injuries kept coming in and, you know, that's ultimately what, what happened. You know, the fans were on, on my back because they didn't think I was working hard enough. And, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, and this is, I always found that it was easier going up the way yeah. than it was going down the way, if that makes sense. Even though we were playing with still good, really good players, you know, the, the players that I had played with, and I take my hat off to, you know, I look at Charlie Adam, you know, and going down, you know, and that's no disrespect to Dundee, but, He's done it week in, week out at Dundee, and that says a lot about him. You know, mm-hmm. I just was probably at that point in my career where I was probably a bit pissed off with everything, with life, with everything, with injuries, with football, you know, and, and my head probably wasn't in the right place. Mm-hmm. You retired at 33. Like how, hard, how hard was that mentally to take that your kind of career was going to be cut short to injuries? It was, it was difficult. It was really, really difficult. I really struggled with it. Uh, 32, 32. 32, I retired uh, because I think the thing, although although I was struggling with injuries, I still felt that I could play. Yeah. I still felt that I could play, and I, and I, I had <laughs> the irony was that in the December I had really looked at myself and went, you know what, probably earlier than that, probably the September time, I'm going to really get back on track here. You know, I had I'd done pre season, I was working hard. Jim McIntyre had came in, you know, I was working hard under him as well. And then uh, we got a, it was an international break, international break, and I went, I went away, I went away over to Spain, and I was just looking at a window, and went to turn right, and done, my, and I just felt my knee clicking, the outside of my cartilage, and I was like, oh, that was really, really sore. So I, I phoned, I phoned the physio, and he's like, ah, no, I went back to the, I went back to the hotel room, and I just couldn't move for the rest mm-hmm. of the day. So it was like, I done it probably about four, four in the afternoon. And I was on my bed to the next day till I came home. Yeah. Uh, went to see the physio and just explained what had happened. He says, you need to get your scan. Went and got a scan and it was a, a, a tear in, the, uh, in my cartilage on the outside, the outside of my knee. Uh, and they said, you can listen, you can play, you can play with it. You can play with it for as long as, as, long as it can and then, but you ultimately need an open. I remember it was, I'm sure it was at Livingston, I went up for a header, came down and my knee just buckled under me uh, and went, went and got the operation, went and got the operation and felt fine, felt really, really, really good. I genuinely felt really good and then went out to do my first run. Uh, I had done all the rehab, felt really good. I'd done the, done the stuff with the physio, went out and I remember it being frosty, just a wee bit frosty and I was running round and and done my calf, <laughs> ironically, mm-hmm. another injury, and then came back from my calf injury, and my knee was my knee was knackered, just kept swelling up all the time, mm-hmm. uh, and then went and got another operation, went and got a micro fracture my knee, uh, and down at Harley Street in London, came back up. Obviously, my contract was done, my contract was up at that time, so obviously I get released, which wasn't a surprise, uh, and. I got a phone call from Derek McInnes to say if I wanted to go into St Johnston uh, on trial. And I said, yeah, 100%. I had done all the rehab in my knee and done the first two days of pre-season. Was, was doing okay. Obviously, a bit behind because I hadn't played for probably the best part of half a year. Yeah. Uh, but felt okay. And then on the third day, my knee, my knee just swole right up. Swole right up. And uh, I just went in and said to, said to Del, listen, Del, my knee's swollen up. Wait to see the physio. He says, Kevin, I think you need to go and see the surgeon on it. Uh, went, and seen the, went and seen the surgeon. Uh, and he said, listen, Kevin, no, sorry, I tell a lie. I went and got, I got, a, I got the second op. Second op was before Harley Street. Went, got the second op. And the, the surgeon said, listen, Kevin, if it comes again, you can come and see me. Uh, and that was... Got that done. Went into St Johnston, that done, and then he sent me a Then I went to see him, and he said, sent me to Harley Street. And, he, and the surgeon down in Harley Street said, listen, your knees, you've got two options. You've got a knee replacement or a bone real, realignment. That's what you've right. got. That's the options you've got. And I was like, I was 32 at the time. And none of the two of them sounded nice. No. None of the two of them said, they said, said what I can do is I can, I've, I've went in and looked, and but your cartilage is, uh, to go on to do anything with it because what they were thinking of doing was putting the cartilage in a, 
in a test tube and regrowing it and then reinserting it mm-hmm. uh, so that it's not bone on bone. Right. But you couldn't do that with the cartilage. So uh, that was that was it, done and dusted. Didn't take the knee replacement, didn't take the bone realignment because I felt that in 10 years' time, so I was 32, so round about the age I'm now, I would have needed to get another knee replacement. I, no. I felt all I want to do is run about with my kids and enjoy playing in a park with them. So I decided against any of them. Uh, and that's that's where it that's where it ended. And did you have a backup plan what after football after football what you were gonna do? Uh, nah, I, I, I didn't really. I was I was always I always wanted to go into management. Mm-hmm. Uh, the few, I had a few a few business things I was doing at the time. Uh, and but the way the way that the, the way that everything happened, I was just disgusted with football mm-hmm. uh, for about a year. I just turned my back, didn't watch it. I think I watched three games in a year, wasn't really interested. Uh, and then got the bug back for it, started doing my own coaching stuff, uh, and done my done my B license, then done my A license, got into it and, and got the bug back again. And you know, that was that was that was where I was, that's where I was at at that point. Yeah, you spent a bit of time at Airdrie and Thornleywood United yeah. as well. How good were they the times there? Airdrie, Airdrie was good under uh, Ian King was there uh, mm-hmm. as, as the director of football. And I was, uh, Gary Bowen was the, the, the first team manager. I was taking the 20s. Uh, but, you know, I, I think for, for me it was, the 20s the 20s were good, but it wasn't as, as professional as I wanted it to be. You know, and I had been, I'd been used to uh, and I, and I left, and uh, my mate was the manager of Thornywood, and he had said to me, he'd been going on about three, about, for about three years to say, let's come and play, come and play. And I was like, I'm not going to play. I'm not going to play juniors because I'll just get snapped all the time. And then I right. was like, oh, I'm going to, going to just come. And I was like, right, okay, I'll come for a bit and see how I, see how I am. And played played a couple of games. Wasn't he fat enough, but enjoyed it. Went back and then done my hamstring. And then I was like, you know what? I'll just, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously the job, the job at Albion came about. You mentioned there about like uh, it took you forty interviews to get a, a job. Like, how hard does it to when you're kind of going for like lower league jobs at that time? Like, how hard does it? Is there, so, is there so many people going for the same job? No, I'll rephrase that. I, I applied for forty jobs. I didn't. I only got one interview. Right. Okay. I got one interview, and that was the Albion Rovers job. Right. And I got, uh, I got two replies back from from two clubs. Uh, one said they were going with experience and took a junior manager, <laughs> and uh, another one, another one uh, came back to me saying, "Listen, Kevin, we've we've got who who we are. Thanks for your sort of thanks, but no thanks." Uh, the Albion Rovers job came up and uh, I applied for it, and you know I had actually forgot I had applied applied for it. I think it got to that point where I was, you know, I was just expecting no, well, nobody gets back to you in football, yeah. you know, and then I got. Uh, I got an email saying they'd like to interview me. This was probably on the Thursday. Uh, they'd want to interview me in the in the, the Tuesday, I think it was the Tuesday. Uh, they were playing it. They were playing Queens Park at the, in the Saturday. I went to watch the game and thought, mm. actually, not too bad. They've done they've done okay. Uh, and then went to the interview. Ended up getting the job that day. Got a call saying, yeah, they wanted me. Would I take the job? And I said, yeah. And then. Watched the game against Edinburgh City and thought, ah, the, the, the players are there. You know, I know the limitations, but you know, I think I think I can do you know a better job with them. Uh, went in, uh, and first game was against Berry. We could beat two 0 down there, which we probably should have. I think if we had scored, we dominated the first probably twenty minutes, and it, then they scored, and I saw the heads going down, and then the next game was it Elgin away. And I thought we could have been about six nil down in about twenty minutes. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh wow, this needs to change. People will. I think it was just they were they, they couldn't do what I was asking them to do, and that was no disrespect to the players. You know, that was just the fact that you know they weren't capable. You know, they weren't capable of matching runners, working hard. You know, just the basic. You know, getting the ball down and playing. And we, I had to change the team. I had ultimately from then to January. I don't think they will certainly to the window open uh, I think 12 games 12 or 13 games I didn't win a game mm-hmm. but I think the thing for me was it was getting better you know the, I always knew that I always knew that the last quarter would be the big quarter mm-hmm. and it was just a matter 
because I had to change the team, I had to get players, and I couldn't change it until obviously the window opened. And that was like 10, ga- 10 games, I think, 10 games. And I knew that I had to just work with what I had got to that point and just hope Berry, who were the team closest to us, you know, would, would be getting beat all the time. You know, so every time we get beat or we got a point, I would rush in and what was it? What was the score with Berry? What was the score with Berry? And they were either lo- they were losing, you know, uh, and we sort of got to within about, I think, five points of them, five points. Uh, by the time I got the players in. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we played them at home and we absolutely battered them and we won it up and they scored like in the last, I think it was the last five minutes or something, they scored what scored to equalise. And I remember them celebrating, and never forget it, I remember them celebrating as if they had, that was them, they were staying up. I think at that point we were seven points behind them. I think they had one game in hand. And then we had played a couple of games and you know, didn't win any. And so we were like seven points behind with three, and they had three games in hand. Mm-hmm. And then the last quarter, we just kicked in. Just didn't remember. Obviously, we got the three points through like the elig- an eligible player. Yeah. We played at Sterling that day and won 1 0. Uh, our keeper made a world class save last minute. I thought the boys' header was in, and that gave us three points. And obviously, we got the six points. That took us to a point. And by that time, we were the same. I think we had the same games played, or, or we were, or they were one, one. I think they were one behind us, and we played the uh, Cowden Beef, I think, in midweek. No, we went up to we went up to Elgin and beat them, and then we played uh, Cowden Beef in midweek and won one nil, and then that's when we went ahead of them. Yeah, and I remember, I remember the last quarter saying to the players, "I want to become." The Berwick game, so we knew we, we played them second last. I want to be at least six points ahead of them, uh, and we were. I think I was. I was disappointed. We were five points. We ended up five points ahead of them. So uh, that was just. I was just uh, because uh, because it was just because of the way that they celebrated on our yeah, pitch. Yeah, you know, and that was that was the thing that drove drove me. You know, and 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 I kept reiterating that to the players. But I think the player the players gave me absolutely everything. You know, we were a really, really tight unit. Uh, and even, obviously, the past, now Michael Duke, the goalkeeping coach, brought us even right, tighter. Yeah. I didn't even think we could have got tighter. You know, and, and I remember that. So, you know, I, I think, I think that period, that period, I had to let our best, probably one of our best players go. Didn't turn up for a couple of games. And, and I remember the, some of the board members saying, I don't think it's the right thing to do. And, and me saying, listen, we have to do this for the club and for the team. Because if I go down to that change room and he comes in, the players are just going to look at me as if I've got no authority. Mm-hmm. And the club's got no authority, so we have to do this. And I genuinely believe it's the right decision. It's the right decision to do. Although it was a hard decision. It was a hard decision. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the players gave me absolutely everything. Uh, and, and, fair, and fair play to the board as well. You know, they didn't flinch during that 12 games. You know, even when even people were muttering that, Nah, he doesn't know what he's doing. He should, he's too young. He's, you know, too much pressure. You know, but you know, they stuck, they stuck by me as well. And you know, ultimately, I think that season, that season was probably do or die for Albion Rovers. I think if, yeah. they, if they went down, it would have been really difficult for them to come back up. I think, and I think you see that with Eric, you know, because Albion Rovers haven't got the influx of cash that most clubs have. You know, and but for me. I'll always be grateful to them. Always be grateful to Albion Rovers. And, you know, if it's the first and only job that I have, then I can look back and, and say that, you know, I left them in a better place than what I took over. Yeah, definitely. As always, uh, is it the, hopefully the plan to get back into management? Obviously, you're doing with the, the, you've started the academy. Talk to me about, about that as well. It was, uh, you mentioned there at the start about the, what the plans for that were, but do you see that really progressing? Yeah, I, I see I see progressing. Yeah, I think, I think well, we're looking at many different aspects of football in the sense that, you know, kids, how, when they get released, what do they do? Where do they go? You know, because I, I know players that have been released and they don't know what to do. No. You know, and we, we, I think we lose so many players at 16, 17, 15, 16, 17 in the game because they get released and they go, you know what, it's not working. You know, and I always look at it and go, if you're a pro youth player, you know, 
when I when I played, you you probably played for one or two teams. That was that was it. I think nowadays you get signed with pro youth, and you know you could be five or six teams before the time you're 15, mm-hmm. 16. You know, and and it's how you pick yourself up from getting released from these pl- these places all the time. You know, and and that's where we're here for. We're here to help kids to understand that. Listen, there's more. I know you want to be a football player, but there's other things within football that you can do and you can still be about. You know, and that's not to say that you're not going to be a footballer. You could be a late developer. There's players that are late developers, so come here, come and enjoy it again. Get the get the feel for it because I know I know how football works. So I wasn't the first name in the team sheet. You know, I, I didn't know if I was going to play week in week out. You know, whether whether I played done really well the previous game and done well in the season in, in the training. Sorry, uh, I always knew that. I don't know if I'm going to every single Saturday. You know, probably a part of it when I was at Hibs, I didn't know if I was going to play or not. Aye. You know, so I know I know what goes through players' heads, and I've had enough injuries to write a book, just in injuries, and that's not my football career. So, and education is key for me as well. You know, if if there's if there's kids there that you know I've got I've got a meeting with one of the colleges next week, and there's you know about about educational stuff for for the players. So the academy will be all compassing that you know we're putting people the right ethical things in place for yeah. kids so that they have that opportunity. And we hope that every single one of them make it as a footballer. But I'm a, I'm a realist in that I know that there's a very small amount that make it. And how can we help these players stay in the game? You know, stay in the game and stay in a game that they love. And that's what the academy is about. Yeah, definitely. Best of all with it. It's, it sounds really good. It's a lot, of, a lot of really good plans for it as well. Are you all right closing some quite fire questions? Yeah, sure. Brilliant. You've answered this already, but who's the best player you've ever played with? Robert Prozanecki. Best player you played against? Dennis Irwin. Favourite away ground? Uh, ooh, favourite away ground, probably... Old White Hart Lane. Very good. Favourite film and TV show? Uh, Favourite film, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. And favourite TV show is probably 24. I know it's a series, it's not really a tape. Nice. But I don't really watch much much TV, to be fair. Favourite fo- favorite football in memory? Uh, oh, I don't think I've got one. I don't think I've got one, unfortunately. I think favourite is probably scoring, scoring uh, my first goal for Hibs. Scoring the winner against Hearts on New Year's Day. Uh, scoring the winner at uh, scoring in that one at Anfield and uh, winning the league with Portsmouth. Brilliant. Who's going to win the Euros? I don't know. I have absolutely no idea, being honest. I would like to see Italy, but, and I don't really want to say this, but I think England might be close. Right, okay, big call. Final question, best manager you've played under? I don't think I've got a favourite. I think every single one of them were really good for me for different aspects of my career. Yeah. Brilliant. Kevin, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Cheers, mate. Thank you very pleasure. much for inviting me on. It's been good. Pleasure. Cheers, mate.